Hi, everyone. Today, uh, Oliver and I are going to go over uh, the Blueprint Protocol. This is what we've been up to for the past 18 months or so. And we've got it structured in uh, routine measurements. And we look at different body, uh, different organs, and then the protocols we have for each. And so hopefully, it, the objective is to give you a high-level overview of the entirety of what we're doing. And then also, there are some specific things which hopefully are useful to you. But a lot of people uh, viewing this from the outside looking in uh, haven't seen anything like this. Uh, we're not aware of others who have gone to this extent in measurement protocol and generation and data production. And so, yeah, we just wanted to provide a 360 view of this, provide you some behind the scenes stories of stuff. And uh, yeah, just, just bring you along for the ride with us as we go. This is an open science project. We, we share everything, uh, the measurements, the protocols, the data, and hoping this will be helpful to the entire field, anyone who's interested in health and wellness. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to quantify the biological age of all 70 organ types in Brian's body and maximally reduce the age ongoingly. So you see here, like we, we basically try to build a daily protocol uh, from the ground up, from the moment I wake up to the end of the day, we try to systematize everything. So every single calorie I eat, uh, the minute I go to bed, we try to system. <laughs> I can't look at my blood draw. <laughs> it's even hard for me to talk as I'm getting stuck. <laughs> okay. Do you have that same problem? Yeah, I, you know, even as a doctor, I can't look at my own blood being drawn. It's too traumatizing for me. Huh. So you turn your head. Oh, yeah. And do you keep it turned or once it's in, do you look back? I'll keep it turned. Give it turned. Yeah. And then do you say, hey, how's it going? <laughs> do you check in? Oh, well, yeah, I make some small talk or, you know, some, uh, I try and distract myself as much as possible. I always ask the phlebotomist, like, okay, so we're doing one stick today, right? Like, <laughs> there's no, <laughs> and there's no fishing. Like, if we miss the vein, there's, you know, like poking around. But yeah, luckily we both have 6% body fat. So it's quite easy to draw from us, which is good. Yeah. yeah. So we, so Oliver and I have uh, built this protocol and it's again, in any given day, it's, I don't know, maybe 200 things that we've implemented that all have, that are based on evidence and uh, peer reviewed publications. And then we try to implement it so that we never think about it ever again. Um, mm, yep. Yeah, because it's, it's very hard what we're doing, you know, hundreds of tests per year across <laughs> Uh, you know, imaging, MRI, ultrasound, blood tests, as we see hundreds of medical devices, all these things, and then hundreds of lifestyle things and yeah. supplements and drugs and all other wonderful things. It's, yeah, it's, no one's ever done this much before that I've seen. It's insane. And it's such an interesting question of if you, if you remove resources as a constraint, Yep. If you remove insurance needing to pay for things as a constraint and you simply say, we're going to survey the world of literature, mm. tease out the best science, implement these protocols with a team that we can be highly structured, regimented, and we can then try to slow aging uh, to a maximum and then try to rejuvenate uh, less an age uh, of uh, the body, if we were to take that to the edges of its scientific uh, potential, where are we at in the world right now? Mm. What, are, what are our abilities? And so that's really what we're trying to probe is what can science do today? Mm. What, what's the most evidence-based protocol physically possible today? Yeah. That's what we're doing. Because we have very few constraints. I mean, I, I do, as the end of one participant, I'm basically willing to do anything and everything that the science calls for. And yeah. we, yeah, it's like in the year 2022, what can a human imagine is possible with the level of health and wellness that can be achieved with the best scientific evidence and uh, a team of professionals implementing it? Yeah. And, and what organ rejuvenation results can be achieved as well? Because, you know, obviously in the future, it's going to be possible, but how much can we do today?
in 2022? A lot of people think when they think of aging, there's this contemplation that in the future, there'll be some magic pill that will perform yeah. magical functions in the body. And that's maybe true. You know, like actually there's a lot of pills that are magical today, but it, it really is what we're showing. What we'll tell you about today is that the, the way we've gone about doing this is to think about measuring the health of a human body through hundreds of markers of biofluids and imaging and fitness tests. Mm. And then once we have that, those baselines of measurements, then we proceed forward with rejuvenation with strategies that slow the rate of aging and then that regenerate what aging has happened. Yeah, all, all quantified as biological age markers as well, as no one else is doing that really, as it's been too hard, uh, as you'll see by the ex insane extensiveness of... Uh, this work over the last 18 months. I think a lot of people <laughs> would look at this and it, it does, it's so far away from the mean of how most people mm. think about health and wellness and standard of care. I mean, yeah, the standard kind of preventive medicine care is WHO recommendations for lifestyle and, you know, a couple of screening tests here and there. That's, you know, when you're age 40 plus typically or 60 plus. Uh, yeah. No comparison. <laughs> and you'll you'll see throughout this video, my body always has evidence <laughs> of the activities we're engaged in. So you see here all these these red marks. This is from an IPL treatment, if I'm not mistaken, a 515 nanometer. Uh, mm. This particular technology was shown to change uh, the genetic expression, and so it's not like a filler or a Botox. Uh, you're looking at changing the way. Yeah, re rejuvenating um, over 1,300 genes to the young transcriptomic levels from this therapy, which is, yeah, pretty cool. As, uh, and it seems to be working. Again, very nice results. Uh, yeah, it's part of one of the many therapies in our skin rejuvenation guideline. So you'll see throughout, I mean, I, I always have um, a healing face <laughs> and body <laughs> from something we've done. This is our first. Go ahead. Al. It's it's important to note early on that you know every test we're doing and every therapy we're doing, there's we're doing this for the clinical guideline on uh you know exactly how to perform the test to quantify the biological age scientifically accurately, biostatistically accurately, and the clinical guideline you know it's peer reviewed. It's like why are we doing this? What is the safety, the inclusion, the exclusion, the evidence base, the uh you know what outcome markers we want to measure? We think it's going to work for. And so on. Yeah, it, it's that's a really important point. The level re, level of rigor and methodical approach we take is unique. Uh, it helps prevent errors. It keeps everything tied down, grounded in science. Yep. Data acquisition. It, it's Alex. pretty crazy. It, it's like a whole new uh, medical specialty or whole new kind of way of doing healthcare in a in, a, in an evidence based way at n equals one rejuvenation that ultrasound machine is the first one we have we now have a new upgraded system a new medical hospital grade yes yeah, it's one in the background We've got the same one yeah same one here we're looking at a whole bunch of uh, msk markers so we're looking at tendon ligaments you know ankles knees shoulder elbows and so this was our first baseline we have a team of sonographers who use our machines and uh, we were trying to assess like where where was the baseline I'm chronologically 45. Mm. What's the state of affairs of my joints? I don't have, I've never had any surgeries on my joints. How old are your tendons? How old are your ligaments? How old is your cartilage? All these things. Because they all accrue damage of different types of age. You know, cartilage disappears a lot. Tendons, they get, uh, you know, inflamed and, and scarred down and thickened. And that's what we're measuring in different ways with ultrasound and MRI. And it's, it's through a disposition of not accepting that aging and deterioration is inevitable. Mm. So we want to find state of play. And then once we know that, uh, we want to then search literature for rejuvenation strategies. So this is getting us a baseline and MSK of the whole body. Yep. Systematic reviews of the literature for every marker to find, you know, all the latest evidence for you know rejuvenating each one of these markers across all the organs 
and then building that into a clinical guideline, which we deploy in a personalized way for Brian. Yeah, we we also have a, a phenomenal team. Uh, I think we're up to like 20 or 25 experts from around the world. Oftentimes they'll video in or they're local. Yeah, I, I like to think of it as like, a well, yeah, we hire a, uh, you know, a local um, or sometimes not local specialist for each one of your organs. So there's like a different a different doctor for every organ. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that new ultrasound machine. Yeah, this was with the uh, internal jugular vein stenosis issue, wasn't it? Oof, what a wild ride that was. How scary. Yeah, pretty pretty unusual as well. Pretty unfortunate. Yeah, so there's uh, we found uh, that I had you know these you have jugular veins here, and they are a major transport mechanism to and from the brain. And we found almost accidentally, uh, like we were doing measurement protocols, but we found this, and I have congenitally small jugular veins. Yep. And it was restricting flow. Uh, to and from my brain, which will cause you know, all kinds of problems in the brain and the lungs and the heart. And it was the first time we found in this protocol something alarming and scary. And uh, we redirected our all entire efforts to address the thing for two to three months. It was intense. I thought I may have a stroke. And <clears throat> it, was, it was a tough situation. Yeah, it was from we're doing a routine, you know, can, whole body high accuracy cancer non-contrast MRI for screening purposes. And um, we have an enhanced checklist for what what quantitative markers or qualitative markers to check for, uh, you know, beyond cancer and beyond what normal standard radiologists will report. And it's from that, you know, from that we bring in extra radiology support to review these scans of different specialties for different organs. And they can pick up things normal radi radiologists can't. And that's how we initially found it on that screening MRI scan. And then we subsequently confirmed it on our, our more advanced, um, you know, uh, more complex head MRI scan, which looks at the magnetic resonance venogram as well, where you see the veins and the flows of them in the head and neck. We, we found in our research, we looked at, I guess we, we discussed the issue with two or three experts who specifically have built a career on this particular issue. They perform surgeries. We extensively looked at that as a possibility. Yeah. But I guess the, the point is we found something potentially alarming and we resourced it appropriately and we found solutions to it. We'll get into it a little, a little bit later in the video of how we, how we solved it. Yeah. I think we're talking about it more later. Yeah. Some nice, uh, Doppler measurements here. One of the advantages of ultrasound, you get very nice uh, Doppler measurements or blood flow measurement speed and, and type measurements, which you can't really get easily or reproducibly with MRI. It's one of the unique advantages of ultrasound. And like an interesting way to think about this is there's a pyramid of value in measurements. In biofluids are great, like blood, saliva. Uh, but imaging is uniquely valuable. And yeah, so you, you need imaging to quantify biological age in, in most organs. It's very hard to accurately quantify biological age and, and truly prove rejuvenation of all, you know, all, all types of aging pathology um, without imaging. And this is, yeah, it's important to know this is like research grade imaging. It's nothing, it's like way beyond what you do in a standard, you go and get an echocardiogram to check your heart kind of thing. It's a very specific protocol with a lot of you know, nuances to make it biostatistically accurate according to our biostatistical biological age marker criteria. Uh, so yeah, it takes a long time. You have to do a lot of repeat measures for coefficients, different types of coefficients of variation reduction. And yeah, it's a big commitment for someone to do it. You can see here the MRI protocol we have it took us quite a bit of time to put this together and then get it right. Like there was a couple times that the product, the sequences weren't done correctly. We had to do it again. Yeah. You got to train the radiographers how to do it. And it's complex. <laughs> uh, 
it's, it's probably the most extensive uh yeah i mean for all of these it's, it's almost the most extensive protocol that's ever been done for uh, each of these organs i think i've spent maybe 15 to 20 hours in an mri over the past 12 to 18 months yeah brain age different brain organ ages thymic age all the uh blood vessel quantification and stuff with the ijv stenosis whole body msk whole body msk yeah whole body cancer screening and yeah you see that in the mri you know you do different types of sequences and then you know beyond what's done standard standard and then you get different types of biological aging markers from each one to see different types of biological aging processes so you need all the sequences combined to truly assess um, as much aging as possible which no one really does yeah i think here we were talking about the coil and whether the coil was adequate for the scan we were doing if i remember that correctly oh yeah and then they're trying to breast coil here for the thymus which uh which didn't work <laughs> Your hair's looking good here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's big improvements. Yeah, I mean, I started losing hair in my early 30s. So we, that, that is, <laughs> so we'll put that in there. That is true. I do love every second of this. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the Thymic Protocol. 3D Thymic Dixon. Of a very specific type specific flip angles and TRs and TEs, et cetera. We're now turning our attention. Sorry to step on you. So yeah, yeah, to quantify uh, thymic age, which no one really tries to rejuvenate, even though it's such an important organ for the whole body. So we've turned our attention to thymic uh, rejuvenation. We're just getting started on it. So we don't have anything to report yet. Yeah, this is the daily morning routine. Yeah. Good old Y things. Pulse wave velocity, uh, 80% accurate to sphygma core. Uh, I think R equals 0 0.8. Not the vascular age, the pulse wave velocity, which they don't show on, on the screen there. But it's a very nice device. Again, PWV measurements, which is a marker of an independent risk predictor and a marker of uh, arterial age, normally in the carotid femoral uh, region of the overall arterial organ across the body. And my last PWV measurement, I think was 5.7. Is that right? Yeah, it's age 33 equivalent, which is the maximum you can go because it doesn't start aging until that point onwards. Yeah, I measured blood glucose for a while. And then it's with my routine, it's become so stable. I've just stopped measuring it. It's now at a steady like 82, I think. It basically doesn't move. Mm, it's great this device though really good yeah the free cell libre is amazing very cheap for like the value that you get from it that uh measurement that we had on screen was old for like a year old oh let's talk let's talk about this one let's go what's happening here i think we're actually doing it the wrong way around it should be like um you know plant like bottom to top of foot um but i think we, this is the first time we were doing it when we're recording it. I've done it a few times since. And it was fine then. But yeah, this is like um uh sensory nervous system, one of the markers you use for aging, sensory nervous system. Because slowly, yeah, the distance you can perceive, the two-point discrimination is the te technical term, uh decreases or increases a lot on your feet. So when you're older, you can only tell about five or six centimeters between two points on, on your uh your plantar foot. And when you're young, it's about 1.5 centimeters. So massive, massive difference. And that's you know, partly due to diabetes and peripheral neuropathy and the nerves being most vulnerable, the most distal part, uh, but also other types of aging processes as well. <laughs> <laughs> Who put this in? <laughs> Can't tell the difference. Can't tell the difference. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do you see that? Uh, there was an American cycle clip thrown in there. We get that a lot in the comments, don't we, actually? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to Are those UV you. gloves? Yes. Yeah. Oh, nice. I was, um, <laughs> I was enjoying what you were saying. I was surprised to see the uh, American Psycho. That's fun. I'm not sure if we're doing a great job here. We, the video is playing and we're not really talking to it much. I guess that's fine. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, we spend a lot of time on skin being the largest organ in the body. This is interesting. This, this, uh, these measurements we're doing, like if you're wondering about your skin age and you get these kinds of measurements, it brings it to life for you <laughs> and shows you what, you, that, what the naked eye can't see. It's pretty scary. Yeah. I mean, this is how I got my kids to wear sunscreen. Mm, there's actually a study on that, that this type of, uh, you know, UV hyperspectral imaging methodology does increase sunscreen adherence. I can see why. Yeah, like that, like a zombie face. Holy shit. <laughs> That's another one. We're using uh, autofluorescence uh, for skin measurement. Measures, yeah, says the advanced location end products accumulation in the dermis, mostly specifically. Uh, yeah, just increases from age five, that marker. It's kind of a progressive thing. And yeah, clinically validated as well for in diabetics. So we have here, we're doing uh, IPL. So we have two lasers, uh, two systems at the clinic. One is IPL and one is uh, a laser system, 532 nanometers and 1064. Yeah, basically for skin rejuvenation, you need a lot of different wavelengths and a, a lot of different pulse widths. Um, and also depends on the individual as well. Cause you know, some people can't tolerate something or, you know, light-based therapies that just don't tolerate in general. But yeah, it's like, you need a lot of different things to to cover all the markers on skin in a time efficient manner across across the whole body. Because people just rejuvenate the face and that's only 3% of body surface or skin surface area. And that's not gonna have a, a systemic effect really. But we, we don't skip anything. Uh, even backs of ears and soles of feet and palms of hands and fingernails and toenails and all that stuff. And this particular technology was shown to change genetic expression. So you're not just looking, it's not a, uh, like a Botox or a, a filler. You're actually changing genetic expression with this therapy. Yeah, you know, massively reverses uh, collagen loss in the, uh, in the dermis as well, which drops about 50% from age 20 to 80 for a type 1 and type 3 and, and the ratio as well. And... Uh, yeah, it's not great for wrinkles, that one. Laser and microneedling and stuff are better for that. And lots of different topicals. And yeah, LED, 630, 830 nanometer, high joules. Uh, also good for wrinkles. And uh, yeah, and recovery post um, IPL or laser or microneedling, et cetera. This is twice a week, 12 minutes each side. Yep. Yeah, it's like cooking your entire body, <laughs> but without not not the old school way where they did UV light and that actually just increases aging. In you know you get those uh, dimer mutations in all your all your skin cells, which is very bad skin cancer. But this is yeah, this is uh, pro regenerative and not just for the skin because the wavelengths penetrate quite deep. Um, you know, you get MSK and. Uh, uh brain brain actually brain benefits as well some interesting studies on uh brain aging on transcranial doppler rcts and uh depression anxiety uh traumatic brain injury one that hyper intensities etc cetera, etc cetera, just from led light and we've seen dramatic changes with the improvements we've made and so since we started measuring my brain with white matter hyper intensities the markers went down from age 69 to 48 yep. in eight months time yeah, and it was it was stable before because it was like three or four MRIs, mm -hmm. um, then a personalized protocol to reduce that. And that's a fundamental aging marker that isn't normally considered reversible, um, except if you have like MS, you know, relapsing or bidding MS, you know. But then it's more of like a, you know, level two kind of autoimmune disease rather than an intrinsic aging uh, based marker. We start also mentioned that the 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 pills that we showed a second ago. We stopped doing those because uh, mm -hmm. we, we do so many measurements to see what's working and what's not working. We couldn't find efficacy with the pills. So we discontinued that. We're still doing IPL, laser, yep. um, LED. That's the thing. Everyone's like, oh, you can't establish causality from multiple multi-component interventions at N equals one. And it's like, you can really. Like it's if the effect size is large enough and you do timings, you know, and you know what the expected um endpoints are at each time point, you can you know whether it's working or not with quite high uh, causality likelihood.
And this here, we're looking, we're doing patch testing of, of uh, various settings of the laser. And uh, we learned why that's important because uh, last, uh, I guess 10 days ago, we increased the, the um, we put more power in on the settings and I had a reaction. I didn't get a reaction, I got burned a little bit. So I have, it's fine. It's not a big deal. It's going to be. Yeah. It's good. No one's ever done it before. This, um, this, uh, such an extensive protocol, particularly on the body. It's mostly done on the face. This, uh, this pulse width, uh, jewels and, uh, wavelength combination, but yeah, patch test. No one ever patch test properly that I've seen. Yeah, and everyone we talked to, no one had a patch test protocol, but we did. We looked at, we did it. Oh, no. Yikes, I can't look at this. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> uh, one thing we did is we, uh, so I'm on caloric restriction, uh, 1,977 calories a day or thereabouts. And that's just resulted in me having like around a 6% body fat. So I've lost some fat in my face. And so we go ahead. Like, yeah, likewise, I'm 6% as well. Same number of calories for like past few years. So we basically were, we're trying to figure out what to do with uh, facial fat because I mean, really what we're trying to do is I've got uh, two boys, 19, 17, and uh, we're trying to make me biologically identical to them. So that if you were to put me in an MRI or them in an MRI and you looked at both of our scans, you couldn't tell the difference. That the yeah, like whole body MRI, whole body ultrasound, hundred different devices, skin imaging, eye imaging, hair imaging, all the blood tests can't tell the difference. Yeah, indistinguishable. And so, like my my boys are such great uh, sports on this. They let me show you. <laughs> they're all, every time we're doing a test, like hey, how how do you feel about being involved? So they're always cool to just jump on. Like this, for example. This is my son, Tal, my 17 year old son, Talmadge. We uh, used all the imaging techniques yep, on, on his face. And so we were comparing uh, facial fat and other measurements, him between he and I. And then this is an MRI. Here is my 19 year old, here is me. So you even look at like the, the amount of fat. Yeah, 3D MRI, the quantitative volume measurements. Because you lose a lot of fat with age, and people think it's like just cosmetic. Same with skin, but it's not. That's a very uh, uh, that's a that's a myth. So yeah, you, it's essential to have young, healthy fat is an organ. Skin is an organ. You need to be young and healthy to uh, function correctly, and also not to affect all the other organs as well. So what we did here is we we were trying to figure out a solution of for face fat, but we didn't want to do. See where's it at? Oh, yeah, here. Oh, I can't. Ah, let me go back and hold that screen. Uh, yeah, I've never had a facial injection. It's uh, so yeah, we did a, a allograft. Um, oh, no anesthetic as well. Yeah, yep. So we injected fat into my face, but we couldn't take my own fat because I don't have any fat. And so the doctor we we spoke to several doctors uh, said if, if we tried to extract fat from me, we'd probably just create an indentation because there's just no, nothing to draw. And also it's, it's not truly reduce Like it's like, uh, you know, HA fillers or whatever. They're often not truly rejuvenative. Like even if you're taking your own fat, that wouldn't be truly rejuvenative. Whereas this, um, yeah, this intervention actually stimulates your net, you know, causes of presumably the mechanism isn't really known, but you know, lots of different Transcription, transcription factor signaling, which activates your natural adipose mesenchymal stem cells to grow over the extracellular matrix and actually regrow young, youthful fat. So this is the procedure for there. Sorry, Ellie, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's totally different from filler. It's like a truly rejuvenated intervention that can reverse age-related fat loss. It's not like a, a cosmetic thing. So again, we're, we're trying to, the objective of this is we're trying to we're trying to rejuvenate again to recreate the biological specifications of my 17 or 19 year old. And so if we can measure my body, we can figure out what the age markers are. And then we go to evidence-based medicine and then try to regenerate those. And so this is, again, we're trying to get to like similar biological specifications for face as my children. So the, you know, the fat organ has a biological age, you know, you accumulate loads of 
senescent zombie cells in your fat organ. Uh, you actually gain fat, you know, in the lower face. It's all, it's all sags down. And, uh, but it's not, it's not just the volume of fat that changes or the distribution. It's, it's the quality of the fat as well. So you have to regrow young, healthy fat. And that is like, that's how you rejuvenate the fat organ. The fat is an organ. People always, always forget that. And there's different subtypes as well. Yeah, you're right. We, we didn't, we chose not to use lidocaine because it's a, a stem cell antagonist. And so, uh, yeah, that, that hurt, especially when they put the needle in and they injected the fat. Ooh, yeah. I mean, Should have used Repivacaine, but we think we forgot. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually got a custom RX of Repivacaine because we were using Repivacaine for the IPL because the laser treatments, uh, the light therapy and laser can be painful. And so we were looking at topical application of Repivacaine. We tried it once and we just, uh, we messed up in the application. I think I didn't have it on long enough. We didn't put it on ahead of time, but. Yeah, we should. Yeah, yeah. People often use lidocaine for MSK, PRP, and autologous uh, stem cell injections, and it's yeah, it's it's a known uh, mesenchymal stem cell toxin and cut you know um, cartilage cell toxin, yeah. bone cell toxin, uh, skin stem cell toxin, etc. So yeah, it doesn't seem uh, it's gonna. I think there's there's reasonable evidence that it reduces outcomes versus non-cytotoxic anesthetics. Our little 3D recon there, that's pretty cool. Oh yeah, this is cool. This is the, we did an MSK. I guess we did a whole body. Yeah, for um, muscle age quantification. One of my markers there. Or uh, you know, total body muscle percentage, because then you're, you've adjusted for uh, body weight, which is you know a major flaw that people forget often in sarcopenia and muscle aging. Muscle age, uh, muscle uh, body muscle percentage by weight just declines uh, with age. I think non-linearly, so uh, which is very very serious. Um, and even calorie, calorie restriction can you know do that as well, but calorie restriction shouldn't change the percentage it just decreases the overall amount which is why the non-percentage based markers for a lot of things when it comes to mri or volumetrics they're, they're majorly flawed so yeah we have msk on ultrasound and mri now looking at yes all about combining modalities because you get disadvantages and advantages of each looking strong this was my VO2 max protocol. I, it was 53.2. So it was the, this was on par with uh, an elite 18, elite athlete that's 18 years old. Oh, hey, Talmadge. Hello. This, this is my son, Talmadge. He's 17. Hey, let's say hi, Talmadge. Hi. <laughs> Talmadge is a good sport because every time we have a new measurement plan everybody wants to get his data so we have a, a biological specification of a 17 year old and he's always a good sport to jump in and play with us he's actually on the blueprint protocol too so he eats everything i eat yeah actually almost everything what do you think about that talmage i don't know i'm just so normalized to it that it feels like <laughs> anything else is weird so I really don't have any points of reference to compare to. Do your friends know what you're doing? Not to the extent. What would they, they what do you think they would think if they knew what you how you what you ate and what your daily regimen was? They'd probably classify me in the crazy category. They already know that I go to bed early and they are they I just developed this reputation like no one no one's gonna text me or call me past 8 30 p.m. <laughs> They just know I'm in there. It's like if they're working on like a math assignment, like I'm just, I'm not an option. So it's kind of nice to have it. Yeah, I, I'm trying to be like Talmadge as I grow up. When I grow young. Yeah, when I grow young. That's right. Did, uh, Oliver and I are going through video over the past 18 months. This is our, our ECG, a 12 lead ECG. We did this ahead of a therapy we're looking at right now. So this is just a baseline recording, but we are doing... Love that ECG. Yeah. So I, we won't talk about it right now, but we're going to do a therapy actually in the next week 
uh, for my lungs. Because in the measurements we did with ultrasound, we found uh, some B lines, which are, were abnormal. We think this is connected to the uh, jugular vein stenosis. So small pipes here uh, that led, and it had bad posture, which led to uh, white matter hyperintensities, potentially uh, aging of the heart and also potentially problems in the lung. We're speculating about that. And we've been working very hard to remedy the damage that uh, was done. So we made a lot of progress reversing white matter hyperintensities from 69 to 48. Let me pause. And then we were working hard on the heart rejuvenation. And so now we have this therapy coming up this week. Uh, we've, we've actually been trying to get this done for the past four months. Oftentimes, that's what it takes us to do. There's always so many problems with getting these therapies up and going. Like, no one does them. So we have to overcome all these challenges. And so we're excited to see if we can make some meaningful progress on, uh, do you want to go into beelines, Oliver? Well, yeah, it, come, it comes back to the point of like, uh, you know, everything we're doing is according to a uh, experimental clinical practice guideline. It's not just like we're randomly trying stuff. It's, you know, we do a systematic review of the literature, write a clinical practice guideline, get it peer reviewed to gold standard guideline criteria like agree to, and um, then decide how to clinically act based on that. And, you know, hundreds of these guidelines combined um, help us like guide on what therapies to try next based on what markers, what biological aging markers we're seeing across all 70 organs. And to me, it's been great to see because it is consistent with what I learned in becoming a pilot where you get in the cockpit of an airplane and you have a pre-established checklist of things you do every single time. And so before you fly a plane, you may check a hundred things as so like walking around the airplane, making sure all the gauges are right, the pressures are right, everything's set to go before you take off. And if you, of course, try to keep that in short-term memory, you're guaranteed to miss a few items. And so as Oliver is saying, the we maintain an extremely rigorous and methodical structure in all the protocols and the measurements, in the interventions, in the follow-ups. We keep, uh, we're fastidious in the note-taking. And so it really is this structured protocol that can scaffold, like all of are saying, is, is that we, uh, I don't remember us really making a mistake that could have been prevented with taking the time, guidelines, protocols. Yeah. Every time we go back to conventional medicine, there's a medical error it's like pretty much 50% of the time. It's honestly stunning. Yeah, it's uh, scary. Yeah, it's the lung, lung age model. You go, you go very strong lungs, stronger than me as well. Do I really? For the moment. I'm working on it. Huh. Oh. I'm going to be <laughs> the better, actually. You got you better, better volumes and... Um, and like, you know, PFER, but uh, yeah, my, my, my B lines are better. So we're kind of even overall. So I need to get down to, what, what, do you have two B lines? You're, you're in the normal range? Yeah, yeah, it's about that. Yeah, or less. I think you're on nine currently. Yeah. It's quite a few. Yeah, I'm curious to see if this intervention is going to have any effect there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah so this is um i was look, capturing my face remembering this so this is one of the very first assessments we did um when we were starting to get our baseline of everything and the woman here who was coaching me was a phenomenal human she was so excited about this thing and she coached me as if i was giving birth <laughs> she, was, <laughs> she was amazing she made it so much fun and like of course you see this you've got to put your mouth on the thing and then you have to uh, suck in and blow out like as hard as you can. So it puts tremendous pressure and you're trying to go for your best scores. <laughs> uh, I forgot how much fun this was. <laughs> like, what am I doing there? Oh, oh, that's right. I'm pulling. Oh, it's the, uh, the MIP in spiritual pressure. Okay. So I'm, when I'm sucking in. Yep. Yep. I think that's, uh, internal intercostal and diaphragm strength. Or external, I always, always forget. But yeah, that's that's diaphragm strength. You know, it declines massively with age, and 
no one knows how to measure it accurately, uh, except us, seemingly. So what's amazing about this is you can see how all these measurements start piling up. And so you know, when we're looking at the lungs like through ultrasound, we're looking at all the measurements of heart ultrasound, MRI, we have all these uh, fitness tests. So you, you get dozens and dozens of markers. You can see here in the lower right, you can see lung age. Yep. And so you truly get to characterize. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you know, massive, uh, you know, uh, you basically, yeah, you have to use, I have to write my own algorithms and software just to manage all the data because it's just it's so much. It's uh, it's incomprehensible at scale at, at the moment, unfortunately. Yes, yeah, so when you have this kind of granularity of, of biological measurement, then it, it allows you to systematically work on these, these therapies and understand whether a given thing is working or not. Like so much, of the, so many of the discussions that uh, people are having in the world is it. Uh, I guess health and wellness kind of feels like almost a religious debate to me where these yep. big camps form and the carnivores battle the vegans and the biohackers, you know? Yeah. And it, it's like, it, I guess I don't really understand uh, at that level of abstraction. I guess that makes sense that people talk about that, but really the only thing that matters is data. And once you have access to the data, then you can abstract out what things are or are not working. And there's not a one solution fits all approach. But it really, it enables us to think about this. We are agnostic to what exists in the world. We're just trying to get baseline measurements, measure the efficacy of the interventions against these things and track them. And really, that's where it would be helpful if the entire field would move that direction, if we could have conversations based on data. And it would... Yeah, yeah. I, you know, there's, a, there's like a small subset of people that do that. You know, they use, they actually measure outcomes of some sort. But, you know, there's they're normally majorly flawed outcomes, or even if they're not, they're not biostatistically valid in various ways. So it's just a, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit awkward, um, really. So this here, we're, uh, I took a, I swallowed a pill the size of a baby carrot. And you know, it took 30,000 plus images of my intestinal tract. Yeah, pretty gruesome, that one. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, then I took laxatives for six hours, and then it came out 10 hours and 38 minutes later. Here we go. <laughs> Easy. Yeah, I take, there we go. Yeah, the gif. Oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, everyone at home who doesn't like that kind of stuff. We've done a lot of stuff on hair. Oh, look at the, look at the surf look there. Oh, it's quite... I haven't seen those images, actually. We should get those uploaded. Yeah, so quantitative hair density assessment. Yeah, we did. We also... And volume. We did a lit search, and we found all the... Uh, given interventions for a daily application to the scalp. And so we did a custom RX formulation of that. And so keep them chilled in a refrigerator. Yeah, the, the hair rejuvenation guideline. Yeah, we I think we're on like version eight or nine. We're doing uh, microneedling hair. Yeah, not just by itself, but with, uh, with topicals as well. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Oh yeah, the point. It's a little uh, bit painful. It's not. It's not too yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. I'd do it as well. 0. 0.5 millimeters. Yep. Yeah, Alexis does a much better job than I do on myself. When I do it myself, oh, there we are. Yeah, it's very hard actually. Oh yeah, good old laser diodes, which outperform LEDs by a, a good margin. So six minutes a day. That's a lot of diodes. Oh, this is the the blood draw for the we did hair PRP. So take the blood, spit centrifuge, do platelet rich. Ah, I can't look. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, inject it into the scalp. Yeah, that's a painful one. It is. I mean, all these things are painful. This one is. <laughs> Particularly, and then we also did our blood tests. 
I always yeah, it comes back to the you know the concept of the rejuvenation athletes, whereas yeah. you know no pain, no gain, and there, there is a lot of pain involved. You know, cycle. You know, well, you know, subjectively uh, and objectively, but you know, there's, it takes discipline to you know to do all these things, all the lifestyle stuff, get all the tests done, even all the you know even all the pharmaceuticals and other other stuff. You know, take discipline to it attend all the doctor's appointments and commit the time to it so there's psychological discipline which can be like you know emotional pain but also mm -hmm. physical pain as well with like uh skin rejuvenation hair rejuvenation uh some tests you know which are a bit more invasive gum injections all these things yeah it takes a takes courage to to do this you're right on the the pain i mean from even the caloric restriction, the 1,970 oh, calories a massive day. Massive one. Yep. I, yep. I am always starving. It doesn't matter if I've just eaten, I'm always starving. And so, yep. And all these treatments, you're right. They, they all have some element of pain to them, a different kind of pain. But yeah. And here we got the uh, epi age testing using. Um, you know, Illumina 850K Epic Array, which is gold standard method. Because once you have that that IDAT file, file, that data of the methylation, you can then apply it to all historical and, and future clocks. Because some are majorly flawed. You know, it's, it's nice to have a lot of different clocks and all the future ones, because you need the broad data for that. Because, um, you know, there's a lot of issues with these clocks. You know, they're not really clinically valid, but most of them. And um, we don't really know what it is in a lot of cases. So... One thing we'll pull up in a minute is we, uh, to our knowledge, we set a world record last year of epigenetic age reversal, 5.1 years in seven months. Yeah. And uh, like, like Oliver saying, it kind of needs to be taken with a, a grain of salt because... Big barrel of salt. <laughs> okay. You're going to say barrel. Yeah. Because... Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Bias, all, all these age markers, they have to meet 15 biostatistical uh biological age marking criteria to be uh you know fully clinically valid and make sense to use and draw conclusions from and uh yeah epi age is on the way it's on the way it's promising uh but it's never sufficient by itself which a lot of people knew or people with no medical background you know that that's what they assume it's like oh measure epi age you know that's aging solves you know if we reverse epi age but yeah these people have no medical backgrounds and they uh you know that's looking at it from a very simplistic and biostatistically inaccurate view, unfortunately. Was well, this PRP? Yeah, preparing the, the play the rich path, yep. So, man, the... Oh, so know, yeah. yeah, so the injections on this, but this, this one uh, hurts. The 13, he, first time we did 14 ml injections in the scalp, it felt like my entire head was swollen. Mm. Uh, and I think it felt like 50 to 100 injections each one. I don't know. I think they, it was like a oh, 17, 19 gauge needle. It's big, but it hurts. Maybe 21. It's big. Oh. Ah, I got to I gotta move past this. Ugh, <laughs> that's too much. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trying to avoid hair transplant, are we? Because like, even if you do hair transplant, right? Or hair cloning, which is coming out next year in the UK. Very exciting. Legit hair cloning. Um, you still have to do all these other things to maintain your hair, uh, yeah. you know, density, volume, thickness, and gray and white hair prevention, et cetera. So yeah, it's got to be done and, still. And some of the, the skin interventions we've done, the skin creams we've had, I was getting blepharitis in both my eyes. And so I went to the doc to see that. And so we then started using this uh, tea tree oil to clear out the blepharitis, but then I just stopped using these serums and, and it went away. But it was an interesting lesson is as we played through the various serums. I've never had blepharitis before in my eyes. So it popped up when using this. But we did a bunch of eye scans. One, when we were looking at my IJV, but then two is we've done a bunch of eye markers. You can see here in the bottom left, a 3D image. So we've done age, quanti age uh, quantification on my eyes. Yeah, yeah. O optical coherence tomography is very nice, as well as uh, slit lamp imaging for quantifying the um, different organs of the eye, organ system for biological age. 
Oh, it's a big machine, that one. Bigger than mine. You have this machine at your clinic? Uh, I got a smaller one. Yeah, that's a very big one. That's the um, enhanced depth one, I think. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Oh, no, maybe it's not. Maybe it's something else. But yeah, the eyes are the window to the brain. So, you know, you can, as Mark is coming out, um, which I'm developing for, you know, you can see like uh, um, different types of amyloids or protein deposits and uh, lipofusin deposits as well and quantify them to assess age of both the eye and uh, parts of the brain as well, which is pretty cool. Oh, same glasses as me. Good choice. Alexis chose them for me. <laughs> I've never worn uh, worn glasses before. Yeah, it's, you chose yeah, the same model. Uh, well, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe I inspired her. I inspired her. But this uh, this test they often don't do without glasses, and then it's it is not accurate for biological aging assessment. Um, you got to follow the testing guideline. This is for. Um, this is one of the oldest tests ever made, actually, for biological age quantification. And literally in 1912, in the paper, it's like, show me the age of your eyes, and like, or show me your show me your result in this test. I can guess your age, and it's really uncanny. It's uh, kind of scary because it's uh, this measures uh, lens stiffness index essentially, and ancillary muscle uh, aging as well. But it's how close you can focus your eye, and it's another one of the markers within the overall uh, eye organ system aging clock. Right there. That's what we're using for the bufferitis. Let's go forward. Yeah, good old tea tree. I have dry a dry eye condition, so I now do sustain five times a day. It's really helped. Did I get it right? Let me see. Ah, nice job. It's always hard to tell if I'm getting directly in or if it's on the periphery. Oh, ear health. Yeah, this was an interesting one. We saw an expert initially, we did an assessment. It was analog and reporting. Then we did a second one that was digital. But I have severe hearing loss in my left ear from shooting guns. I grew up, we we shot a lot of guns and I'm right dominant. So I had a gun down like this way, my left ear is exposed. And so in the frequency ranges where the noise come from the guns, I've got severe damage. Yeah, I think you're, you know, one, one of your ears was uh, age 61 or so. Yeah. And uh, yeah, going to need some, probably some intra, you know, intra, intracochlear injections potentially uh, to rejuvenate that. And, uh, you know, some of that audio, audio cardio is nice as well, but it's annoying to do. It is. Were you, were you wearing headphones when, when you're doing the shooting? No, we didn't. Sadly, oh we, wow, okay. That's the thing is, we we um, didn't wear sunscreen, ate sugar cereal, and did wear headphones. Like as a kid, <laughs> it's I don't know. Cliche. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When we we find these markers, for example, like we found, you know, the white matter, my white matter hyperintensity in my brain. We found these markers on my hearing. So it's really motivating when we find something like this we want to regenerate it, rejuvenate it. And so, yeah, the ears, like Oliver saying, we're trying to find ways in which we can go about doing this. So my crow's feet there, that's, this is like a year old, but we've done a pretty good job. And that's partly, it's partly from a uh, caloric restriction and facial fat loss during the, you know, the first half of the protocol. So going, you know, level one, two, three. So you're going to lose that fat in initially as you induce caloric restriction progressively. And then, uh, uh, yeah, once you reach the end, the end point, you can start restoring the volume and uh, more aggressively treating the, the crow's feet with various interventions. I sat in a, a sound booth and we did various, various measurements. Yeah, and like, you know, these uh, hearing, hearing aids, they don't really count as a, uh, you know, rejuvenation mm -hmm. therapy. Cause they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, a pretty, they're kind of like a, you know, it's not truly rejuvenating the ear. It doesn't regrow the ear to the, the ear anatomy to uh, younger levels. So a truly rejuvenative therapy would do that. But, you know, prosthetics are great. 
they they do count in in some ways um but often yeah they currently they're not they're not a great solution for um complete rejuvenation of hearing to you know age age 10 levels when the ear starts aging so this is what we typically do here you're seeing that we we did the first analog measurement with the hearing but we we want a digital because uh, more precise measurement and for our record keeping. So we, we bought a machine. And this is typically what happens. We'll take a given area of exploration. We'll find out what's commercially available. And then uh, we'll go see a doctor and do it. And then we'll try to bring up the infrastructure in-house entirely. So we'll buy the equipment ourselves and then hire civil experts. And so our team now is like 20 plus people from around the world. And the, the clinic we now have a lot of a lot of testing equipment and so building up this expertise in house is really important so here we're doing it yeah like you know every test has a, has a guideline as well and like unless you if you don't follow the guideline you can't actually make the assumption that your organ is a certain age because it has to be you know if you're using different equipment or different methodologies then it's going to be inac totally inaccurate so you have to use the exact right things to make sure, you know, to enable you to measure the age of an organ. It's very dependent on a lot of variables. You can see here, these red marks here on my chin. This is, we found these red spots with the, uh, looking at the facial scanner, the skin uh, age markers. And then we use the 532 laser to treat that. And so this is still healing from that. Yeah, and that's it in the background. Good nails. Good nail health. Let me see here. Oh, let me go back. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Ah, right there, yeah. We bought this machine. So this is the laser that has 532 and 1064 nanometers. Yeah, it's a great machine, that one. I've recently been painting my, my fingernails, which has been fun. Yeah, it's, it's fun comparing uh, audiograms with, uh, with each other. I think, is there a picture? Yeah, the loss. There's one of you, you comparing against Talmadge. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, so Talmadge is, we'll show an image in a minute. He just had, you know, hearing that was normal and then mine crashes down. Yeah, we're testing up to 20,000 Hertz as well. So it's uh, a lot more comprehensive than your standards, you know, one, two, five to 8,000 Hertz. I'm trying so hard. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this one's designed to not require a sound booth. It's uh, clinically validated to yeah be done without a sound booth, which is a, a big benefit. These are actually really exhausting. It was thirty to forty five minutes. Yeah, it takes a while. We did we did a test two or three times. Yep. Yeah, there we go, right there. There's the results. So pretty sad story. Actually, this is our first one. Our second one, we had different results, uh, but similar story in terms of the frequency ranges. Yep. Yeah, so we need to figure out if anyone out there knows how to help us rejuvenate my hearing, please get in touch with us. Yeah, I need some uh, advanced therapies for that. It's mostly stem cell and uh, gene therapies that are showing promise in the early studies, which have been going on, early clinical studies. How much rejuvenation have they shown? Um, in, in mice, it's really good. It's like very big. But uh, I don't think there's been much published data yet for the, or like in, interim data in the clinical trials yet. Hmm. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Still waiting. It's uh, quarter one next year hmm. when some of the interim results are coming out. 
I had custom ear plugs made. I am sensitive to hearing. I, I don't like loud noises. Mm. So I, just having some, I can just pop in any place. Yeah. Well, active noise casting headphones, like they're very good as well. And also uh, Apple Watch, you know, it's got like, um, got the, it's, it's pretty accurate. Yeah, it's got the uh, decibel meter function, which comes on automatically. Because you'll be surprised, like, you know, even in, uh, well, especially, in, obviously in shooting, but even in like, uh, like a pub or uh, what you think would be a quiet bar, it's still like 90 decibels often, which is, you know, and if you're there for like three hours, it's what? My safety level is 75 decibels. I never go above that. Yeah, that's very safe. That's very safe. <laughs> Yeah, 85 is like the standard cutoff, but I like to go for, you know, 80 because it's, uh, you know, there's inaccuracy in these decibel meters often as well. You know, that's the thing, like, um, as medicine gets better, you can just expose, you, you can age your organs, you know, expose yourself to these risks and then, uh, mm. you know, reverse the damage. But we're still, you know, we're on the cusp of that. We can do it in some ways. But um, yeah, the, the lowest risk strategy, of course, is prevention is better than cure at, at this point. So I had uh, bruxism for 20 years, which means I, I would grind my teeth at night, probably due to all the stress of life. And so because of that, I had a lot of recession and my teeth were in not great shape. So this is one of the very first things we worked on. And we've made... Uh, remarkable progress. So reduced attachment loss by 41%. We did a bunch of, bunch of procedures and I we created this daily protocol. So um, yeah, recession's gone down as well, which yeah. is, yeah, that's the core aging marker for gums. Yeah, we have a fantastic dentist partner that uh, has worked with us on this. So we, I think we've done six different uh, interventions or six different, um, mm, yeah, different types of injections. Yeah. Yeah. A recent, the most recent appointment I went with Talmadge, my plaque index was lower than his <laughs> and, and my dentist. <laughs> and your dentist. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the goal. It's got to be done. Yeah. Cook you 10 for the gums. So that again, like the, the Coach Q10, I'd never heard of this before. And we found this in a study of it being, there was good evidence showing that it had a positive effect on gum health. Yeah, tea tree as well. Loads of uh, easy interventions that work on top of flossing and brushing. Yeah, okay. This is a uh, blood draw for the dental procedure. Oh. <laughs> There's a lot of blood draws. More Manuka honey. That's a lot of Manuka honey. <laughs> we need, so, I don't it's always think, so hard not to eat it when I put it on. <laughs> you know, I don't think we have a a, a protocol for a Manuka honey, applica uh, Manuka honey application. I don't think we measure it. It's just Oh, it's just it's just put it on, yeah. Put on movement, right? Yeah. Yeah, we did. This is Embro gain and uh, PRP with some bone. Yeah, some some good uh, Regen Med industry discoveries there. Embro gain and PRP for gums, gum rejuvenation. Yeah, and most people are my you know our dentist partner was saying. No one thinks about rejuvenation in oral health. It's all just a downhill. So she's, she sees somebody and they're just like, okay, it's going to get worse. But she, she was like, if everyone is doing our protocol, she would be out of the job. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been really energizing for her. Ooh, that's a lot. That's a lot. And this is a good yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, that's a beautiful. Yeah. My gum age map. And the and the tongue in the middle there on the right. So probing depth, recession, uh, recession pocket depth, gingival index, plaque depth, cal uh, calculus index. So pretty comprehensive oral dashboard. 
it's uh it's just weird like you know all all hygienists and dentists well almost all of them they're, they're still using pe you know pen and paper on their uh periodontal reporting forms and uh and no biological age quantification of course because no one does that but that's you know the it's it's easy to do and it looks really cool there's a lot of green here there was not as this much green when we started yep so we've had significant success with oral health yeah this first one was like two and a half hours this procedure was she doing laser at the end of that as well she did yeah the um i can't remember what wavelength that is but i think there's a few options i forget what laser uh what wavelengths she used yeah it's it's in the guideline but yeah also laser like a lot of a lot of dentists don't really use laser um even when it is it's indicated for a lot more things than what it's normally used for honestly this is an important concept culturally a lot of people treat sleep as something that can be negotiated on a daily basis so if the day goes long or you have a deadline the following day or whatever people oftentimes consider sleep to be something that can be squeezed and i made the decision early on that sleep would be a lighthouse that it's just a non-negotiable there's a, a story behind this i won't go into it now but you know, i go to bed at 8 30 and almost nothing can move that time frame yeah sleep regularity index very important oh yeah great setup and my sleep is uh spectacular i mean i've you know, having three young kids and oh, being an entrepreneur my whole life, there's been like a fair share of stress and turmoil and difficulty. And so sleep has always been uh, something challenging for me. Uh, and now it's just, uh, I love it. It's one of my favorite things I do. <laughs> changes how I understand and feel about life. I mean, it changes everything. It changes a lot with age as well, sleep. Like you can use it to age the brain in some respects as well. Because, you know, you're getting like under five hours sleep by age 80 plus. You're getting massive WASO, reduced mm -hmm. deep, reduced, um, you know, increased arousals, increased apnea, hypopnea index. We stop breathing and get sleep apnea and all these things. Loads of massive changes in sleep quality and quantity with age. And yeah, you can quantify your sleep age using all those markers as well. And yeah, yours is very good. Yeah. yeah, last night I got three and a half hours of REM, two and a half of deep resting heart rate. It was 46. My wake after sleep onset was 24 minutes, which is something we want monitor closely. Yep, under 30, normal range. Yeah, it's it, so about the trends of these as well. You know, the average for 60 days or you know, that kind of region. Yeah. HRV as well, very important. Yeah, we have almost doubled it. Yeah, on um, yeah, deep sleep RMSSD. Five minute HRV weekly average. This is my morning drink. Do we have the recipe up here? No, we don't. No. We don't. Yay! <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty. Thank you, Alexis. Mm, yeah, it's a good setup. Because often, uh, once we get to this many pills, we have to switch from like the seven day pill boxes to dedicated morning and evening uh, currently it's like 100 pills a day and it, they're all with clinical rationale it's not just like oh let's take 100 pills for no reason there's like a strict criteria on um rationale and outcomes for each of these pills and vendor yeah vendor like quality assurance gmp independent testing etc yeah, maybe at the end of this, it might be worthwhile to pull up the panel of markers to just, just show where we're at. Oh, this is, yeah. So breakfast is oh, yep. super veggie. Go back. What's that? Yeah, yeah. That's good. So this is what I eat for breakfast every day. Goo. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So I you can do it in a non uh, pureed fashion, but I just find this to be, it's more efficient. And it takes quite a while to eat this. This is like, uh, I think... Oh. 300 plus grams of broccoli, 250 grams of cauliflower, garlic, ginger, 
uh, 250 grams of lentils, black lentils. So yep. it's, it's a lot of volume. And I do that with a tablespoon of olive oil. And then recently yep. I've just added a tablespoon of pure dark chocolate. And yep. that was a surprise. I did not expect dark chocolate to pair well with blended veggies and lentils and olive oil. You tried that? It's it's a hundred percent. That's why, you know, it's, uh, it's cocoa, isn't it? Undutched cocoa rather than having sugar with it. Cause if it's, if it's like actually traditional dark chocolate, which is like 70% or 85%, it's going to be very sugary and that will taste very weird. But yeah, as it's, as it's pure, it's an interesting flavor combination. It's honestly like I, I drive so much pleasure knowing that I eat this every morning, uh, the density of nutrients from the vegetables, the lentil, olive oil, chocolate, uh, as the first thing my body encounters on a daily basis. Hemp yeah, seeds. This is a, a croissant. This is Talmage's. So he doesn't do his purees. You can see there's a volume of vegetables. So it's a lot. It takes a long time to eat this. He does chicken. I'm, I'm vegan except for collagen peptides. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it's not like we're saying everyone should do this, you know, with any, any of this stuff, you know, it's all highly personalized to the individual. Yeah. You know, there's loads of nuances to it. Like you got to build up certain types of foods slowly so you don't get side effects. Mm -hmm. things. Yeah, this is nutty pudding. So this is uh, macadamia nuts, walnuts, uh, pomegranate juice. Cherries. Quarter. Yep. Quarter cup of cherries. Yeah. So this is basically my, my fat profile. It's delicious. This is the third meal of the day. Let's see. Oh, the fat third meal of the day was, what was it? Yeah, like a salad. We take chickpeas, pomegranate seeds, some guacamole. Yep. So uh, in, in the video we did last year, the Blueprint Protocol, all three meals were pureed. I think the third meal was a soup. And people are like, hey, wait a second. You're on a geriatric diet. <laughs> <Blueprint diet. laughs> yeah. So, the gum is an 18-year-old, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing the dentist said is my, my gums are like an 18-year-old. Right. That she she cannot make my gums bleed. Uh, she <laughs> says, it's amazing that I have a better plaque index than all the teenagers, but I have gum health of a teenager. Yep. It's going to follow the protocol. And yeah, key thing here, you know, there's a lot of uh, meal prep. Because prepping this every day, it would be yeah. a horrible experience. And then, yeah, I see, yeah, that's the chocolate. This is 100% pure dark chocolate, which is bitter. Undutched. Yeah. yeah. Yep. High polyphenol, low heavy metal. So we actually, yeah, I think we should pull that. We have a slide where we show slide. Yep. like like basically blueprint in five levels of thinking. We'll pull it up to show how we generally think about it. But yeah, just chocolate is my favorite. That's also uh, all the extra virgin olive oil we do has six different criteria for the polyphenol density and the oleic acid. And so we we try to be hyper specific, and not just like Oliver is saying on the supplements, like everything has a clinical evidence based rationale, and we then follow the markers, but we do the highest quality yeah. inputs everywhere. Because there's good evidence that uh, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil that is ultra premium and meets certain criteria, biochemical criteria, gives better clinical or biomarker outcomes than your regular extra virgin olive oil. And that's why we do it. And then you saw there, I, I, have a testosterone patch. That's an M androderm two milligrams patch, which delivers, I think, uh, is it nine milligrams of testosterone, something like that. Yeah. I can never remember this one. Yeah. So it's, we, so with the caloric restriction of doing less than 2000 calories, my testosterone dropped to in the four to 500 range. And so we started supplementing with the androderm two milligrams patch. Yeah. So I think you, you had the free testosterone index of age 70 equivalent or so. Yeah. Once we reached, you know, sub 2000 calories, which, you know, 2500 is a normal RDA for a man before even doing more for exercise, you know, like lots of exercise. So it's a very low caloric intake. And yeah, it's kind of like balancing the, uh, you know, the benefits of cal caloric restriction and, um, and some you know, side effects that you get. So you can drop testosterone too low. So this is just keeping it in the normal range. It's not, we're not doing like uh, testosterone above the normal range, which is basically not healthy. It's just keeping it in the normal range to reduce that biological age of pre testosterone index to from 70 to around in the 40s or 30s as well. 
Yeah. And to clarify what Oliver was saying, so it's less than 2000 calories and then I work out rigorously for an hour a day. Yep. I have been, I'm actually shocked that I've been able to maintain a healthy body weight and body fat at that level of activity at that caloric count. And so as Oliver saying that one of the side effects was lower testosterone, but now we're back up in like eight, 800, 900 range with that patch. And yeah, free testosterone as well. Yeah, that's right. And this is a, a non-feminizing estrogen that we worked on. This was we worked on this for a long time to get this uh, to find a supplier and then have our custom uh, pharmacy compound it for us. This is applied weekly, but it's one of the uh, most promising interventions we have in terms of uh, lifespan. Yeah, so a lot of therapies, you know, we're using off-label. That have been done in uh that have been shown in gold standard reproducible mouse lifespan studies. And yeah, this is one of those examples. And it's been used for decades for hair regrowth by over the counter in some countries. And yeah, you know, repurposing it for longevity. This is the first time I applied this. Yeah, so two minutes in a a small spot. This is my daily workout. This is a year, like a year and a half ago, I was trying to assess where I was at with strength. And so we were doing a baseline single rep mat, mat, max on bench and leg press. Yeah. Yeah. For uh, strength age, you know, leg age and upper body age, muscle age assessments. Yeah. We've seen this guy. <laughs> I, yeah, again, on that estrogen, it's not like we're just randomly doing it because a mouse lifespan study did it. There's a whole clinical practice guideline peer reviewed for every, you know, the rationale behind it, the safety monitoring, the efficacy monitoring, et cetera. It's, it's very, you know, it's a very thought out process. It's not just like, oh, let's try this on a whim. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> every day. Some days I wake up and I, I look. I know this entire list, and I think, "Ooh, <laughs> but yeah." But I do it every single day, no matter what. And again, you know, this you've been doing this for a long time now. Uh, you know, strength training, not something. You know, we're not saying it's something. You know, <laughs> there's a gu there's a guideline for building up strength training. It's not just like you jump straight into this uh, relatively extreme protocol. Yeah, we're also doing a lot of the measurements. We're looking at my whole body measurement of muscle and tendons and ligaments with MRI and ultrasound. So we're able to quantify yep. dietary intake, fitness routines, and the effect it has yep. across the entire body. Tendon age, ligament age, joint capsule age, cartilage age, muscle age, across the whole body. So I'm, I'm pausing here because... Uh, the expert we found when we found my, my jugular vein stenosis, a primary problem was I had had bad posture. So you know, my, I had my chin out and like my neck jugged like this. And so I became obsessive about my posture during this process. I still obsess daily about my posture. I probably think about it 40 times a day more, uh, but always trying to be in a perfect posture, like a, imagine this, a, string above my head and pulling me straight up. And so this is one of the PT exercises he has. So elbow straight back and then moving my, my shoulders forward, which uh, builds the muscles that I need to keep my neck in the right posture. And, and, it, and it's worked crazy. It's like, amazing. It's like, unbelievable. And we had a, with avoided our skull based surgery. So that was such a, although that was such a scary situation. We talked to two world leading experts that do the surgery. So they go in on the side of the neck, uh, which is really complicated because you've got so much happening in your neck with nerves and muscles. And, and then they shave down the bone, the styloid process uh, to try to eliminate this narrowing of the jugular vein. Yeah. And this expert we had was like, you know, actually like, so he, we were talking to him about this, but he's like, you could also make significant progress with this PT and so we've been working on this now. We, we saw the study where they, they'd done the surgery and there was no improvement in clinical outcomes. So it's like, what the hell? <laughs> pretty, yeah. pretty worrying. Three people in 22 who received a, the surgery had mm -hmm. sustained benefit. Everyone else 
And our experts said, like, of course, because it's a postural problem fundamentally. Like, you sure you've got eagle syndrome and other stuff where people, yep. you know, you've got other structural problems. But interestingly, we did with our new Epic Five ultrasound machine, the the medical grade, hospital grade machine. We looked at my jugular veins last week, and it's night and day difference. Before you you could barely see flow in some postural positions, like when I was laying down. But now when we get it, you have volume flow see, rates. Yeah, it was amazing to see the flow. Uh, how exciting! I mean, especially when I was, I was pretty worried I was going to have a stroke. <laughs> yeah, like morning frontal headaches. You know, raised ICP signs on MRI. Yeah, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with these piercing headaches, and I thought it was COVID, so I'd run downstairs and do a rapid antigen test, and. I never had it. I just couldn't understand why I had them. And so when we found the inter- the jugular vein stenosis and we started piecing together my symptoms and we saw it on MRI and confirmed it with ultrasound. So yes, yeah, so I guess I just mentioned this is uh, this to me really is the value of what we're trying to do. We did the extensive measurement. In this case, we found something that was potentially life-threatening. We pieced together world experts, again, used mul- multiple measurement modalities implemented protocols and then measure the progress going forward and we're able to fix it. And we searched the world over for this thing and no one knows how to fix this thing systematically. And it was great to see our team succeed so thoroughly. But it can be very serious. Mm-hmm. Yes, there we go. So yeah, so I'm trying my best to maintain. It's like you, you have to, yeah, that's really, it's a really hard movement. Keep your elbows back. And then this is the second one. So trying to strengthen that. <laughs> yeah, let's get that one. And then I put wallpaper. That This makes me so happy to walk in the room and feel like I'm in a forest setting. Yeah, I like, they should do that at gyms more often. That's pretty cool. It's a good idea. Yeah, I found a, a few different prints that had a high enough res that could be wrapped around the whole gym. Yeah, it, exactly. It has a... Significant boost of yeah of how I feel every morning. Yeah, yeah. Studies on that as well, or even with plants. You know, not great studies, but from personal experience, love a few plants. So this workout takes me. I guess it depends on if I do extra sets on each one, but roughly forty-three minutes to complete the whole thing. Yeah, and the, you know the IJV stuff goes to show you know everyone ages differently not just because of lifestyle but also you know congenital things which what it might have been in this bilateral IJV stenosis case i love this stretch here oh i don't do that one that's yeah looks fun it helps me feel flexible Mm. yeah it flexibility is very good yeah it I can feel throughout the day if I'm loose or not. This is just two, two times doing this in the morning. Yep. Especially because offset sitting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've both got standing desks, haven't we? And got a cycle chair as well. It's quite fun. But you know, really, this workout is designed to take care of basic bodily health, knees, ankles, hip flexors. Yep. I need to, on that, that form's bad. I should be extending <laughs> further up. Yeah, up to straight. Because yeah, flexibility, it's a big part of, uh, people don't quantify flexibility, you know, or like introvert or spine, often spine age as well. It's one of the markers for that. And it, you know, it declines a lot with age. It's really a, a massive cause of poor quality of life, losing flexibility and poor MSK markers. That was one of the first ones we did. Uh, one of the first markers yeah. with the, the single rep max on bench and then leg press. And then we did the uh, stretch. Yeah. Reach, that's right. Yep. So I think I was in like rough, the 18 category for all those. Age 18 for all of them. Yep. And above median, like, you know, top 10% perhaps. Oh, yeah. You know, I didn't really do much hamstring work 
growing up. I guess it was kind of a muscle that was neglected in. Yeah, calves, hamstrings, often forgotten about. I'm much better at these now than feet muscles. Yeah. I'm better at these than I I was. (laughs) This is, um, I did, I played a lot of baseball. And so this, this basically works the muscles opposite of throwing a ball. Hey, that's in there twice. Is it? No. Oh, it's a different one. Hands forward and hands back. I do very little biceps. And then uh, high intensity interval training. Yeah, good for uh, cardiac. Well, yeah, lots of different organ rejuvenation, actually. But yeah, yeah, especially cardiac. If I don't work out on a daily basis, if I don't get this workout in, I just don't feel the same. My body feels a little stiff. Right. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a drug exercise. The shot feels oddly close up on my chest. <laughs> That's my son, Jefferson. He was, he's an exceptional coach. I love going to the gym and just be like, all right, tell me what to do. And he keeps my form flawless when I otherwise would not be able to do it myself. It's very important to have a coach. Yeah. You know, actually, you know, although I don't have that on a daily basis, I really miss having Jefferson there on a daily basis. He was so good. Yep. A lot of evidence for um, the importance of a coach for, you know, preventing injuries and improving outcomes and, you know, long-term adherence to these things as well. Hmm. Yeah. I'm missing that now. Because people often just go to the gym and get lost and mm-hmm. quit or get injured. Yeah, makes me really miss Jefferson. He's off to college. Yeah, I think you're stronger than Jefferson on uh, a lot of the markers. I am. He he beats me in several categories. Mm. Yeah, it, they, it's so fun competing with him in Talmadge. <laughs> We've been, we've actually, so Jefferson was really trying to help me uh, so I could dunk on a, on a a dunk of basketball on a 10 foot rim. And he, I think has succeeded. He's very, very close. Yeah. It's not like like you guys are like six foot four. It's quite a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. We're all six foot. Yeah. Yeah. We're all identical. Same weight, height, (laughs) Body Same fat. body fat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe more muscle than you. This is this is Jefferson, the real result of Jefferson's coaching. I do really want to perform. So I guess I haven't seen this in a long time, just remembering it. Oh yeah. So this is oh yeah. That's Talmadge. And uh <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> That's it. So I think maybe just to wrap this up, Oliver, it may make sense if we just show uh, a few bits from this presentation we have. Yeah. So if I, so one way that, that um, Oliver and I have been thinking about this is, you know, we've been, this is just so much fun for us on on for so many reasons, but it's also a project that's kind of hard to communicate because, you know, is it, is it just general health and wellness? Is it, you know, quote unquote buyer hacker? Is it, and then how do people discern, you know, does it fall in categories that they understand? Like, is it a vegan diet or a carnivore diet or, and people try to create categories in their mind, like, what is this and how do I understand it? And one thing we've been playing with recently is to frame this as uh, what, if there was such a thing as a professional rejuvenation athlete, what would the person's daily life look like? And that's what we've, we've put in this presentation to share with a few people. And so you can see the highlight here, like the, the, all the images you just saw in that video, that this is what uh, Oliver was talking about. We're trying to do 78 Oregon biological age measurement, age measurement, and then rejuvenation. And we ex- rely extensively on scientific back protocols and peer review publications. So this is 
not finding trendy things or uh, debating things in the abstract. It's all based upon science, evidence, and data. Yeah. N equals one research grade, clinical guidelines, peer reviewed for everything, bias to be rigorous, uh, biological age measurements, both molecular and phenotypic across all organs. It's like no one's no one's coming close to to this. <laughs> and so if you see like, is it working? How how are we doing? Here's a dashboard of our latest measurements. Yeah, so these are some common markers that you know, kind of everyone's somewhat familiar with. Um, but the key thing here is this isn't just the reference range, which isn't, you know, super evidence based. These are, we go for the, uh, you know, my optimal clinical outcomes range or OCOR range, which is, uh, you know, a lot more strict than the reference range. And that's the, the level where you get the maximum risk reduction in, you know, heart disease, all cause mortality, good surrogate biomarkers, et cetera. And yeah, we get an optimal for all of those, which is well, almost all of those. You need biological age markers in all the organs as well. Because all of those will still increase with age, but these are still optimal. Just slows it down the increase a bit. That's all. Yeah, exactly. So we're basically, you think about it in two ways. One is there's slowing the rate of your aging. Yep. And then there's reversing the age that has occurred. And we're working on both. So this, yeah. So you, First is, you know, go ahead, Oliver. Yeah, Get, getting all these optimal, it's just, it's very, it's quite easy relative to actually mm -hmm. reversing biological aging in organs. And yeah, it's not, it's not sufficient at all to, um, to rejuvenate organs a large amount, but it's essential because you need a baseline, you need a healthy bodily environment for a lot of the rejuvenation therapies to stand a better chance of working as well. Yeah, so this is, again, like a list of the measurements we've done, all of which are younger than my chronological age. It's kind of our trophy dashboard, but it just gives you an idea of... Examples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is not even all, it's just some. And then we have all these age clocks. So we, we track what we do in terms of the age markers and what, how the therapies are working. Yeah, this is a uh, nine months in quite an early early dashboard. Mm -hmm. uh, some examples there, but yeah, we're 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 coming up with some organ clock clocks now, which integrate a lot of different markers inside each clock. So imaging and devices and biofluids combined. One of the more interesting concepts, uh, Paul here uh, tweeted this out. You know, is generally we are pretty enthusiastic about our technology. And Apple created this culture of excitement around the unveiling of new iterations and new technology and other companies have followed. And there's it's a cool idea to imagine, could we get into a new place where advances in human improvement uh, of our health and wellness and scaffolding up into not just people breaking Olympic records and not you know, things we're accustomed to, but could we really imagine aspiring to human improvement in ways that were not previously part of our imagination. So can you imagine events happening that are unveil unveiling new ways humans are dramatically improving themselves and we get ourselves on improvement curves that are impressive in the same way we look at technology. And so is, is you know, this kind of like, is there a blueprint style keynote that would get people excited about the future of being human in a ways in the same way as we look at our technology. Yeah. Like we've gone from iPhone, iPhone one to iPhone 14, but there's no analogy in humans, right? Like yeah. everyone that people haven't even proven they've slowed their aging process a little bit. They're not even measuring their age in an accurate way. And you know, there's no analogy. It's been fun uh, to share these things publicly. I mean, blueprint is, as you can see, it's difficult to implement in your life because it's, pretty extensive in terms of the equipment and the protocols. However, a lot of people have in fact implemented many things in the protocol and they've seen significant life changes. And so it's been really fun to see people, these are people playing around with the update, you know, looking forward to the updates, but uh, there's, it's a, been a really great community that's formed around this and people are very engaged. They're seeing significant life changes. And I think for a lot of people, it has significantly helped them punch through what to do because a common thought process is they'll say, well, 
you know, first science says this, then they say this. Does anybody know what they're talking about? And we've punched through that. We we don't engage in these high level abstract arguments of this or that. We just look at the science, the data, and then we, you know, if you look at the dashboard, like is this working? Yes. Like we've got the data and we show this over a long period of time. So we just we there are answers. It's not an unknown area, and you can figure this stuff out. Because you can have, you know, sure you need gold standard evidence based medicine clinical guidelines and everything. But if it's not working for you, it doesn't matter. That's, you know, the N equals one data trumps everything. And this is a dashboard of, of how this looks like on a daily basis. There's quite a few things we didn't talk about today. We covered a lot of the basics of like the imaging protocols, the exercise, food, measurement. Uh, for example, we didn't talk about synolytics. So these are the zombie cells. When cells stop dividing, they become zombie-like and they excrete these bad things in the body. And so you want to get rid of them. And analytics kind of clear them out, like taking out the trash. And so we've implemented, as far as we know, the most advanced analytic protocol in the world. And we, so we aren't sharing everything. We will share more about this in the future when we have more data. But just, yeah. So much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have a lot more that we have done and are doing, which we've not shared. But we will. Uh, just to give you something to look forward to. Oh, this is the chocolate thing we were mentioning before. So we really do think about this every time uh, in a methodical way. So clinical guidelines, checklists. Yeah, systematic reviews, peer review, biostatistical rigorousness on uh, clinically valid biological aging markers. It's the only way it can be done. There's a big difference between if you just think, okay, chocolate is good for you, and then getting to level five and finding the actual undutched test for heavy met tests for heavy metals from regions of the world with the highest P uh, polyphenol density density. Uh, there's that's the difference between this debate of of like we don't know what's good for us and how to pierce through these debates to actually getting results that are repeatable. And we do try to take this approach through everything we do. All right. Yeah. References for everything, not just uh, intuition, which is very dangerous. Oh, yeah. The biological age market criteria. Very, very important, but quite boring to explain. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went through all this stuff. This is just the stuff you saw in video of the various things. Yeah. Some fun images. This is from the, <laughs> the laser. We, uh, we chill it very quickly. Oh, yeah. This is. Uh, we mentioned the measurements. This is Talmadge, my 17-year-old. His measurements is hearing. This is mine. Oh, yeah. Right right ear age, 61. Mm -hmm. Up to 8,000 hertz, left ear, 51. Yeah, there's a lot of organs I'm not covering in, in detail here as well. Uh, oh, yeah. See that in the middle. Yeah. It's kind of too much to go through. Yeah, we've made yeah we made a lot of progress on this. I mean, it, it took a lot to uh, go from zero to where we're at now. We've learned a lot of lessons. We move a lot faster than we ever have. Uh, but still, like we're, we're always pushing the boundaries of what uh, people are familiar with or accept. And so it's we're constantly pushing through friction. Uh, sexual health that, you know, this was uh, a lot of people are familiar with like basic sexual health uh, panels, but we went pretty extensive on this. It's really something that should be more robustly measured in life generally. Mm, yeah, the guidelines are quite flawed, in my opinion. The uh, the national ones. Yeah, there's a list of the supplements. This is all up on the Blueprint website at 140, 104 a day fitness. Oh yeah, this is what we mentioned before of epigenetics, and Oliver's mentioned with a barrel of salt. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> for, the, for lots of reasons. Yeah, and this is the write-up of the jugular vein stenosis, um, mm. which I'm so proud of our team for addressing this as quickly and as thoroughly as we did and achieving the resolution. Yeah, and this is a mentioning, so I've got nine B lines when I should have two. So, yeah, and I have gray hair. You know, like I was 
uh, I think I had gray hair when I was 27 years old, really, I think from my chronic depression and at that point, not now. And I was, I was an entrepreneur, startup after startup, three young kids, bad relationship, leaving a church I was born into, like just a really brutal time for me. Yep. And we've not yet been able to reverse the gray hair. And it's one of our things we're trying to figure out how to do. Yeah, we've got some strategies, but uh, I think we've, uh, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we prioritized volume first, didn't we? Volume and density before, uh, color yeah then we saw this my my boys being the reference point you can see this is interesting here oh Look yeah my posture right here like this is why this was a contributing factor to my uh, my jugular vein being stenosed is um shocking to see that what terrible posture yeah the cervical angle is uh very big some recent images so we're trying i mean this project is as much health and wellness as it is artistic for us. So we're just playing around. Yeah. And that's it. All right. Any final comments, any thoughts on your side, Oliver? Yeah. I'm just interested to see the, um, you know, if we can achieve what people perceive as, uh, you know, true scientifically valid multi-organ, you know, organ age rejuvenation results in the next 18 months. I, th I think it's possible. Uh, we've done some already, and yes. yeah, I think it's going to be a very exciting results. Eighteen months time. Yeah, that's a great point. We've the majority of our time thus far has been on establishing our measurement infrastructure yep. and getting the to prove it works. Yeah, diet, exercise, sleep, and so that's really about slowing the rate of aging. Yeah, level one stuff. But recently, we've been putting increasing more of our attention on age reversal. We've already started that, several things we haven't talked about. But yeah, I agree with you that the next 18 months are going to be uh, quite exciting. Yeah, it's all about starting with the lowest risk stuff before you know increasing the, the risk, but also the benefit as well. Potential benefit. So hopefully this was helpful for all of you, uh, even if there's, you know, a small number of things you can implement in your daily life. I mean, I guess if, okay, so if someone's like, all right, give me the TLDR, what do I do? <laughs> I mean, what, it'd be like a caloric restriction. Yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky because you need a, you need specialist guidance to do that really. Uh, and most dietitians aren't trained in it, but basically world health recommendation, world, world health organization recommendations for the level one stuff, which is all the lifestyle stuff, you know, their recommendations for exercise, diet, not smoke, smoking, 14 units alcohol, BMI in normal range. Those are ex extremely effective, extremely evidence-based and work very well. And only 0.3% of people in the USA actually do all of those in, to the best extent. So yeah, most of the gains for most people are going to be in the level one stuff, the, the lifestyle stuff. Uh, and yeah, it gets a bit more complex after that, even with caloric restriction, because you're going to need clinician oversight and the clinician needs to be trained in these experimental like guidelines, et cetera. So lifestyle is never a bad idea. Whenever you're in doubt, you go back to WHO recommendations pretty much as a very simple summary. There's, they're more nuanced in reality, but you know, if you just want a simple solution, it's WHO recommendations. And many of the, I mean, all the protocols we have, we shared today are on the Blueprint website. So the recipes for the daily, for food intake, for supplements. So if you do engage a, a doctor or a clinician to help you, You've got a starting point, a reference point on diet, supplements, exercise, and then you can modify it for you know, your specific circumstances. But hopefully it points you in the right direction and gives, gives you hope that um, you can find answers, that it's not, a, it's not an unknowable thing. A lot of people get frustrated thinking that it can't be known and they're just confused by all the different people debating various things, but you can actually achieve these outcomes in a systematic way. You can measure the age of your organs. You can try experimental therapies to rejuvenate them in a safe, rational, clinically valid way. That's, yeah, that's what we're doing. So we'll post again uh, very soon. We're going to do these more often. And so good luck with uh, whatever you're going to implement. Hopefully this will be useful to you over time. See you.